Hello everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce uh, one of your own uh, back to Merton for, for his upcoming lecture. Uh, Dave Charlton was a Merton undergraduate uh, under uh, the days of Bowler and Binner, Binning and Baker, uh, which was a few years ago now. He, he, he's a, a postmaster of this college, as I'm sure some of you. Um, and he, soon after graduating with his, uh, his, his, his top degree, as you would expect, in, in physics here, headed off to the University of Birmingham to work on particle physics experiment, where he had an honor which, is, which few particle physicists have. So some particle physicists find particles. Some particle physicists don't find particles. But undiscovering particles, as I've discovered from Dave, he did during his PhD, is a particularly unusual honor. So at, at the stage when he was doing his, his, his depot, his PhD in Birmingham, the top quark had been recently discovered at the UA1 experiment at CERN. And uh, it was him amongst others who realized that the purported discovery was completely incorrect. Uh, that the, the data didn't show a top quark at all. It was showing various other backgrounds. And, uh, and he, uh, as part of his, his, his PhD thesis, showed that uh, there was no top quark there at all. And the top quark was found at much higher energies about seven years later in Chicago. Uh, so, so at the time he started, the top quark existed, and by the time he finished, it didn't. That, that was a major contribution to science. Um, <laughs> uh, as well as working on the, that was at the proton antiproton collider at CERN, he has worked at the electron, the large electron positron collider at CERN, uh, working on the properties of W and Z bosons there. Uh, and uh, as it was clear that uh, the future is going to be the, the large hadron collider and proton proton collisions, he moved into the Atlas experiment, having already been uh, the physics coordinator of one of the, the, the experiments at the, the left which preceded it. He took over as, uh, showing a immaculate timing, he took over as physics coordinator of the Atlas experiment just after the LHC gas leak, uh, which was the point at, uh, at which uh, I think Sir referred to it as a gas leak rather than an explosion, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and prepared the way for all the physics that was to come. Uh, thereafter, he became the deputy spokesperson of the Atlas Collaboration, and in March 2013, the spokesperson of the International Atlas Collaboration, which involves about 3,000 uh, physicists from around the world, effectively the leader of that experiment, um, which he has only just stepped down from uh, in the last couple of months. So he's put in four years of very hard work in that role, um, during which period he was also elected fellow of the Royal Society and so on. The, the, the previous spokesperson of the Atlas experiment went on to become a time person of the year candidate and director general of CERN, but Dave has managed even even greater things than that because he is your welcome lecturer for this evening. <laughs> and so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Dave Chow. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, uh, what we're doing now at the LHC, i.e. the on these discovery, and uh, I, I've titled this, as uh, grandly, The Coming of Age of Atlas and CERN LHC, because as you will hear as I go through, we're in sort of change of phase in the LHC. So this is the outline of my presentation. I'm going to talk first of all a bit about where we start. I'm not going to start really right at the beginning. I'm going to start with the Higgs discovery which, although it seems like yesterday to uh, those of us who were there, of course, it's now five years ago. Uh, then I'll talk about the LHC and Atlas. Uh, to set the context, of us, uh, we'll go back a little bit, but to talk a little bit about why I call it coming of age. Um, I then will talk about what we're doing now with the discussion beyond the discovery. And then I will uh, say a few words about things beyond the lease that uh, we are looking for, or that we are doing beyond the lease uh, sector. And then I'll say a few words on look to the future. I probably this will be quite short because I will run out of time. So uh, let me start. Let me uh, start with uh, the standard model. Now I uh, won't insult you by leaving this up for very long, but this is the standard model of particle physics. You're familiar with the fermions, the matter particles, the bosons, the carrying forces, the vector bosons. 
And then uh, when I started showing this slide many years ago, this of course was a big question mark in the middle, and now we know that there is at least one uh, exposed one sitting in there. Um, however, you're used to seeing this, you've seen it so often that you, you stop asking some of the questions about it, and I'll come back to some of those later. But the, 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 the structure of this thing, why it looks like it is, is something we don't understand uh, really at all. We just know it's like that, so the universe is like that. Um, so here is the Higgs discovery. This is a photograph of the, uh, of the seminar. Uh, at CERN, you made an auditorium at CERN on the day of the discovery, which was July 4, 2012. Um, I like to show this picture because I like to show you where I was on that day. I was in Melbourne in Australia on the other side of the world, having just got off a flight that lasted about 40 hours. So it's amazing that I was away at all, but it was pretty exciting, so I could stay away. And it's uh, these three people that you see here, actually three of the four spokespersons that Atlas has had, who happen to be sitting together all looking very sleepy in, in Melbourne, uh, and the four spokespersons are here. So. So that this, uh, I think for reasons which nobody entirely understands, except for a lot of preparation by CERN, this really caught the imagination of the of people around the world. And I think that hope did a lot of good for science in general. And so this, this is just one of the headlines that I, I like the most. This was in the garden. This is an act event, I should say. And uh, I think this uh, particular headline is one of the nicest ones that was written to encapsulate this. So what did we see in July 2012? Well, what we did was we looked, uh, to, sim to, to show you in, in essence what we did, is we looked, in, uh, we looked for a new particle decaying to two photons or decaying to four leptons. And here is the two photon case. And it, the nice thing about a particle decaying to two photons and only two photons is you can reconstruct the mass. This is the invariant mass distribution of two photon pairs. And this is the distribution we saw, saw in the data shown by the points. And in July 2012, this was uh, what we saw. If you, there, there's a huge background here from known standard model processes. There are many processes producing by photons, but they're not. They don't give you the mass bond. They don't give you the resonance. And so, if you if you make a fit to the background shape and, and uh, then subtract that background fit, we saw this little bump here. Now, you, if you're experimentalists, you used to even the students in the lab, you, you look at that and think that's not very significant. And indeed, on its own, that's not very significant. Uh, but we did actually a much more sophisticated analysis than this, looking in lots of different categories and so on. And it, it did start to look pretty interesting that there was this bump of 125 GeV. Now we have the independent channel, the four lepton channel, where the Higgs decays to two Z particles, one of them uh, off shell, not, not with its uh, full mass, um, and decaying to four leptons, so four electrons or four muons, or two electrons and two muons. And we did the same business of reconstructing the mass distribution. Here is the, the background shape, and then here, for example, you see the Z, the Z in case of four leptons occasionally, not very often. And then uh, in blue is shown what you would expect for a Higgs signal. Now, if I haven't put the Higgs signal on there, I hope you can still have seen there was some sort of excess of that. Again, on its own, that doesn't look tremendously convincing, I, I would have to say, I don't know if you just looked at that. But when you put all the information together, you look at the other event properties and so on, uh, you can do a calculation, you can calculate as a function of the mass of a hypothetical new object, putting together those different channels, what's the probability that that's just described by background? And that's what's shown in this plot, this the so-called local P0. It's just telling you what's the probability that the data is consistent with background as a function of the mass of a hypothetical new object. And we have this huge uh, dip here, which when we added another channel, WW, was at the six sigma level, so a probability of about 10 to the minus nine that you would have got that sort of observation just by random fluctuations of the background. And so that's enough to call it a discovery. And we liked this plot so much, we made the t-shirt. Um, unfortunately, I didn't wear it this evening because I was told that it wasn't the appropriate standard of dress. <laughs> OK, and we also, of course, wrote the paper. This now has uh, about 7,200 citations and uh, 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 probably is the most cited paper we've got until we discover something else. OK, so um, the discovery of the Higgs uh, did crystallized some questions, or the discovery of this boson as it was in 2012. And so the first question of this new particle was, is it a Higgs boson? Now that I will answer in the, in the following slides. Is it unique? Is there only one Higgs boson? Are there more? This we don't have an answer to. So far, we only have one. Does it couple to vector boat? So if you see this Higgs cloud here in the Higgs field, which is giving mass to different particles, you see it's the same Higgs field, which is giving mass to the W and Z bosons, the electric symmetry breaking but it's also giving mass to the fermions. Now, it, you can write the theory in a way that that isn't the same Higgs boson, that there's multiple Higgs bosons. So is that the same Higgs boson that's coupling to the fermions and the, the W and Z? This is a question that uh, we needed to look at. So is it the same particle responsible for giving mass to the fermions? 
And then is, is the, the Higgs really the only mechanism for electroweak symmetry break? Is there, is there more to the mechanism of electroweak symmetry breaking? What gives the mass to the W and Z than the Higgs? And these, these types of questions we are looking at, and we can study them particularly via precision measurements, trying to measure the Higgs particle, the Higgs sector, as precisely as possible, and also looking at other processes in electroweak symmetry breaking. And then another question which fits on this slide of questions crystallized by the Higgs discovery is, well, why is it so light? Now, that, if you're not familiar with this problem, it, it sounds like a weird question. But we know from other measurements I'll show you later that the, the, quantum, the, the quantum field theory structure uh, that describes the standard model is, is extremely precise. And the radiative corrections, we see the effects of radiative corrections, things like loop diagrams and so on. So that one of the loop diagrams which is there in the standard model um, is... The, uh, a loop diagram with top quarks in a Higgs propagator, which means that that actually gives you a correction to the mass of a Higgs. Uh, and that correction, if you try to calculate it, it turns out it's divergent because you can have a, a, a form momentum running around this loop. And you have to cut that off at some point, which presumably is the, uh, new physics. But if there is no new physics, if the standard model is correct and there's no new physics up to the Planck scale, so where we start to unify with gravity, then this thing is very divergent, and we can't explain why the Higgs mass is so low. And this is the so-called hierarchy problem and fine-tuning problem. You have to put in a coupling here, artificially by hand, which is you have to tune to something like one part in 10 to the 30. And this, this I mean, Ockham wouldn't like it, I'm sure, and uh, I, none of us like it. And so there is this uh, sort of semi-theoretical problem, but which is very well motivated because of the, we know that the structure of the, uh, of the quantum field theory uh, works, the radiative corrections work. So this is another, another important uh, question to try to understand the answer to that. Um, then there are other questions that are not addressed, and I referred to these briefly before, things like why are there three generations of fermions? We know there are only three generations of light fermions from the data we took at LEP. Why are the masses so different? If you think of an electron neutrino, the mass of that is at the most, it's at the level of electron volts. Uh, top quark is then 10 to the 11 times heavier. So again, there's huge numbers in here, which we don't understand at all. Uh, the, the gauge theory descriptions of the electroweak and strong sectors of the standard model are, are also very, very similar. We can write them down in a uniform way. We can do calculations and so on. But we, we managed to unify these three guys, the WZ and the photon, in a single framework. What about the gluons? Can we, can we, uh, where, where are we going to get the unification of the strong and uh, electroweak sectors of the standard model? So where is grand unification? And all of the people who are worrying about M-theory and brains and so on, if that's right, then there have to be extra dimensions of space-time somewhere. And I have lost the pointer now. Um, there have to be extra dimensions of space-time somewhere. They may be very small scales. Maybe they're things that we can see. And so, again, this motivates another set of searches at the LHC. Then there's the question of the baryon asymmetry in the universe. I won't talk at all about that, but there are as another ex or other experiments particularly looking into that. And then there's the whole issue of dark matter and energy, which we know dark matter is there in the universe. We're pretty sure it's there in the universe. Is it something we can produce at the LHC? And uh, since we don't have an answer to that question, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it uh, today. But nonetheless, this is a big part of the program is dark matter. OK, so searching for new physics at the TEV scale can gain us further insight into these problems and also to the hierarchy problem. OK, so let me switch now uh, to the more experimental side of things of the LHC and ATLAS and the coming of age. So uh, no talk on the LHC is complete without this particular uh, picture. This is the LHC ring. It's actually buried 100 metres below ground. Uh, you see here, that's uh, Geneva Airport runway, and you see Mont Blanc nicely in the background. Let me pass on immediately and show you what's under the ground. And what is under the ground is not only the LHC in its tunnel, but also there's this whole set of uh, actually historical uh, accelerators, the so-called injectors, as we call them now, for the LHC, which were there in some cases back to 1959, the proton synchrotron. This is still used as uh, pre-injector for the LHC. And in fact, a lot of the success of the LHC is because these uh, injector, uh, injectors are able to produce such high brightness beams, such high intensity and high brightness beams. So, a large part of this injector chain is also fundamental to the, to the uh, good data taking at the LHC. OK, so if you go down into the tunnel, you see uh, the magnet. Uh, these are, this, this is just a cutaway view of one of the dipole magnets. Um, it's the, the, this two-in-one field design, so the two beams go through a single magnetic uh, setup configuration. And there are 1,200 of these magnets around the ring with a peak field of 8.4 Tesla. Um, the scale of the thing is perhaps illustrated by uh, the fact that each of these guys has a cryogenic 
circuit which is superconducting around three kilometers and the whole system is, has about 90 tonnes of liquid helium. So the small gas leak that we had in 2008, uh, one-eighth of these 90 tonnes of liquid helium turned from liquid helium into gas, and that uh, isn't really just a gas leak, as you all realise, that uh, it's quite explosive. OK, so uh, looking then to the experiment, uh, ATLAS, uh, the, the, one of the big experiments at the LHC, one of the two largest experiments, uh, Atlas, the letter of intent, was actually put together in October 1992. So Atlas now is actually this year, it's celebrating its 25th birthday. Uh, and so uh, this is another reason why I think these things, uh, at some level, we're, we're reaching a certain maturity in the collaboration. We know how to work together when the collaboration is, is 25 years old. So in the original letter of intent, this document, there were 88 institutions already from around the world. And indeed, Oxford, of course, was one of those institutions, as was Birmingham. So here are the countries which have institutes in the Atlas collaboration now. Uh, we have 182 institutions, universities and research labs, in 38 countries around the world, which are coloured in here. We have about 3,000 scientific authors, and about 1,000 of them are students, PhD students and master's students. I should say, if I put on the, here the nationalities of the people working on Atlas, a lot more countries would also be filled in, like India, Pakistan, and quite a lot of the African countries. But at the moment, they don't have, uh, well, particularly the African countries, don't, uh, don't have particle physics communities locally, but perhaps they will. So this is the Atlas detector. It's a very familiar structure. I won't spend a lot of time going through it, but it's 7,000 tons. It's 45 meters long. It's 25 meters high. The interactions are here in the center, and the, the bunches of protons cross every 25 nanoseconds. Now, you're all physicists, so I can say that's every eight meters. So 25 nanoseconds is eight meters at the speed of light. Um, and so uh, the detector itself has about 110 million channels, which if you think about modern technology, you think about a digital camera, that's not actually a lot of channels uh, by modern standards. Remember, Atlas was designed about 20 years ago. Um, but it does have timing capable of separating the particles from the adjacent bunch crossings. So when you have a collision, the products of the pre previous collision are spreading out through the detector, but they've only gone eight meters. So they're, they're actually overlapping uh, collisions in the detector. And so that gives us a lot of uh, interesting challenges to get the timing right. OK, so you, it, when I show this picture of Atlas, I've been showing this same picture for a long time. So people think, OK, Atlas is finished. It's all done. But it's not. We're, the detector is evolving. And so here you see just some examples of the evolution. This one is actually from three years ago. But these guys are from the last uh, uh, stop at the end of this year, so the last month or two. So there are some new muon chambers, for example, being installed down in the bottom of the detector to complete, uh, give additional coverage. And then this is a very forward detector far along the beam direction to measure very small angle scattering, 220 meters away. So there's a lot of hardware work, development work going on all of the time. And I'll come back to that later. OK, so let me now then come to uh, the first decade of LHC operation. So the Higgs discovery happened here back in 2012. And that was in, in the, or somehow the culmination of what we call run one of the LHC, which did start, it's actually a little bit earlier here, because it started 2009, 2010 as well. But the big data samples came in 2011 and 2012. So that was run one, which was really looking back now, little data and low energy. But nonetheless, we were able to find the Higgs uh, due to the excellent performance of the, the detectors as well. Now we're into something that we call run two, which is after the two-year stop, we're now running again at 13 TeV center of mass energy. And then we will go on to run three at 14 TeV mass energy after a stop in 1920. OK, so you see a common theme here is pushing up uh, the energy. We're also pushing up the luminosity. So we're pushing all the time to try and get more and more intense beams. And the amount of luminosity is indicated by these numbers here. I'll come back to what an inverse femtobarn is. But basically, you see a factor 5 increase and then a factor 2 increase in luminosity. And then after that, there's the high lumi LHC, which is another uh, 15 years after this. So why do we push retest? This, this is probably familiar to all of you. So I will go very fast. But you, you're all aware of part of Parton density functions, I guess. Everybody's aware of parton density functions? He says no. OK. <laughs> so why do we push the center of mass energy so much? Well, it's because when we're running the LHC, we want to produce both the objects we know about, like the Higgs, as many of them as possible. But we also want to produce new massive particles, if there are new massive particles to be produced. And so what we do is we, or the way this is described is that one can what we're colliding together rather than colliding together the protons. What we think of is we're actually colliding together the quarks and gluons inside the proton. Now, those quarks and gluons, the point-like particles, as far as we know, they only carry a fraction of the momentum of the proton, which is described by this variable x. 
And here you see a, a probability distribution, as it were, this uh, part on density function as a function of x. And note it's a log scale here. So the probability that one of these quarks or gluons carries the full uh, momentum of the proton is zero, basically. But if you want to know how, what's the probability, relative probability that it carries 1%, then the, the chance is much higher. OK, so these are, these are distribution functions. But you can see that the, the vast majority of the uh, material in the proton is effectively carrying just a small fraction of the momentum of the proton, which means there's a big sea of gluons and quarks in there. But what we want to do is we want to produce objects. For example, if we want to produce Higgs bosons, we want to collide together quark anti quark that will give us a Higgs. So we want to, or two gluons that will give us a Higgs. So we want to produce a system which has a, a, a center of mass energy of the colliding parton systems, which is equal to the mass of the Higgs. OK, so we can, ex we, can, we, we can recast this. This isn't quite what we need, but we can recast it in terms of a thing called the parton-parton luminosity, which integrates over one of the x's, effectively, and says as a function of the, uh, of the, of the center of mass energy of the colliding partons, the colliding quarks or gluons, what is the probability distribution to get different, uh, different values of this? So this is the, the so-called parton-parton luminosity. And again, it's, it's very... Uh, dominant at, at low values of masses. So we, pr we produce lots of low-mass objects and very few high-mass objects. And wh why, wh why this is really interesting is because when we're going from 8 to 13 TeV, we can make the ratio of that distribution, those partonic luminosities, uh, for the two different center of mass energies. And so when you look at this plot, if, you, if we're trying to produce an object of 100 GeV, what this plot tells us is we produce twice as many of them for the same number of colliding protons uh, than we did, because the, the axis here is 2, than we did at, uh, uh, at 8 TeV. But if we go up to 2 TeV, for example, and we're trying to produce particles, then we get about 10 times as many of them at 13 TeV as 8 TeV. So this is why we're pushing, trying to push the energy, because the reach is really going up. And the expectation uh, is, is, is well predictable by this type of parton-parton uh, part -on luminosity ratio. And in fact, you see that here for a whole set of processes. So these are different types of processes, different particles we produce. Uh, w and Z particles, relatively rare uh, in, in uh, PP collisions, top quarks, um, then multiple objects. And these guys are all about factor two to four uh, increase in uh, rate or increase in uh, cross sections as we go up in as we go up to uh, 13 TV, but here there's a whole bunch of things which we haven't seen and we're looking for, and so these guys the the multiplication factor the boost factor by going up in energy is huge. I mean it can be a hundred uh, or even a thousand if it's a peculiar type of object. So none of these things are things we've discovered as of yet, but nonetheless uh, we have far, far more sensitivity as we go up to 13 TeV. And so this uh, has stoked really a vast number of searches at uh, 13 TeV to look for this new physics. Okay, so to get there to higher energy, we have to, uh, we have to make consolidation to the accelerator. I won't spend long on this, but just to say that the place where there was a problem in 2008 was one of the interconnects between these two dipole magnets. These interconnects are superconducting interconnects that are put together uh, in the tunnel, and uh, one of those exploded, in, or one of those uh, developed, actually it just developed a, a bit of a resistance rather than a zero resistance in 2008, and then you got ohmic heating, and immediately that... Uh, uh, meant that the helium evaporated and that caused the uh, explosion. So all of these joints were inspected and about a third of them actually were repaired. They were remade in order to be able to get up to the high energies we're at now. Okay, so now we're here in the middle of this uh, run to data taking period. Let me skip on and say uh, in this plot what I show is the delivered luminosity. So the amount of data that we collected uh, as a function of time during the years. And so the blue and the green, these are the, run, the two good years of run one, the 2011 and 2012. When we started in 2015, it was a, a pretty much a touch and go, yeah, I'm glad I'm not here giving this talk at the end of 2015, because at the end of 2015, we'd barely got the machine running. It was really a lot of work to get uh, anything out of the machine. There were uh, one or two things which were basically mistakes which had been made in the improvements of the machine. But those were fixed for 2016 data taking. And so in 2016, we've had this incredible luminosity performance. Uh, and that has given us a data sample now which is larger than all the previous data samples put together. Plus, you have to have the multiplying factor because we have much more sensitivity for any unit of integrated luminosity. So I promised I'd say a little bit about femtobarns. So the reason why we measure luminosity in inverse femtobarns is because the number of events you get is just the cross-section for a process, which is in barns or femtobarns or nanobarns or millibarns. And then if you multiply that by integrated luminosity, 
and your units are inverse stamped advance, anybody can do it without even needing an envelope. So it's, a, it's an easy calculation to do. Of course, you have to know experimental efficiencies. Okay, perhaps I skip over that guy. And then just to mention the, well, perhaps you want to know what the weasel is there. <laughs> so this, uh, in this plot, it just shows, this is the peak luminosity at the start of a fill during the year in 2016. So I showed you this tremendous slope of luminosity that was collected. Well, this tells you the, the instantaneous maximum luminosity. And we pushed beyond the design of the LHC for the first time in 2016. There are, however, some gaps in here, and these gaps in here are, are when there were problems. And so you shouldn't get the idea that the LHC, you just switch it on and it works. This is an incredibly complex system. And so here, for example, this, is, this was another explosion. This was an explosion of one, one of the power supplies for the proton synchrotron, one of the injectors, which happened early last year. It's actually somewhere here. But then for some reason last year, we had two weasels during the year, which managed to creep into the power transformers. They didn't get anywhere near to the LHC, but it's where the electricity, the 400 kilovolt line that comes in from the French... Electricity. No, it's not the same weasel. The weasels do not meet a good end after this. Uh, <laughs> um, we, the, the remains of the weasels have been found, but the weasels were, uh, uh, yeah. The, the weasels also would not, did not want to be in there, that's for sure. Okay, so that, that gave us two more of these dips in here, we're actually due to weasels. And uh, it, it, you wouldn't believe, I mean, you say, well, why don't, why don't we have weasel proof fence? But of course, we do have weasel proof fence, but the weasels are clever and they get through it. Um, so. More work on that as well. So for 2017, we, we had a stop over the break, and now we're going again. Uh, so this is really just hot off the press, just to say both beams were circulating again in the LHC on the 29th of April after the, the end of year stop. And then this is just uh, this one was taken actually on the 10th of May, uh, five days ago. So this is. Uh, this, the, this shows that the beams are colliding again at 13 TV. This is an event picture from Atlas zoomed in on the, the interaction point. Um, and so we're not really going properly this year, but the, the LHC is waking up again, and we'll start with uh, stable beams physics collisions in about two weeks' time. So we expect to match or exceed this fantastic 2016 data sample in both 2017 and 2018. So things are going, are looking quite good. Okay, so then let me come back to the Higgs boson and talk a bit more about what we've done with the Higgs since the discovery. Uh, in fact, at this point, if we just talked about 2012, July 2012, I should say the boson, because if you remember at the start, we didn't even call it a Higgs because we weren't sure we could call it a Higgs. So uh, how, one of the, uh, some of the key things we have to establish about this particle is how it couples, how it interacts with the other particles of the standard model. And we do that partly by looking at how it's produced and how it decays. So what you see here are a set of four uh, of the most important production diagrams for producing a Higgs boson at the LHC. Now, I'm hoping that diagrams are familiar enough these days that people can figure out what this means. So here I have two gluons that come in and they fuse. There's actually a loop here, which is probably a top quark, um, and that produces a single Higgs. In this case, I have two quarks that come in. It these are two Ws or, or two Zs which fuse together. This is the so-called vector boson fusion channel and produce a Higgs. But they also have two jets in the events that are shown here. In this case, uh, a Higgs is produced together with a W or a Z boson. And in this case, a Higgs is produced with two top quarks. OK, so these are the main production diagrams. And uh, one of the, the nice things about uh, 125 GeV is that all of these diagrams are important. So the cross-section for these different processes is shown here. And you see glue glue fusion, is the this process is the dominant one. But the others are only down by factors of about 10 or 20. And so we can actually look for and try to measure all of these different processes. They all look different in the detector because there's different final state particles. So we can separate these out. And they tell us different things about the couplings at these vertices that, uh, of the Higgs to the different types of particles. OK, so uh, if we put together all of the information that we got from the run one data, remember this is the 7 and 8 TeV data, and we put that together uh, in a combined analysis, actually, of both Atlas and CMS data, we can express the production, uh, how well we've measured the different production processes uh, in terms of this parameter, which is called mu here, which is a normalized rate to the standard model. There's many mu's, I'm afraid, in this talk, but this is the rate normalized to the standard model. So if the Higgs looks like a Higgs from the standard model, these guys should all line up on one. So the measurements are all shown here by the, the data points. If you just concentrate on the black ones, these are the combined Atlas CMS results. You see everything is consistent with one, and they're, they're generally all a bit higher than zero. With TTH, you sort of, I, I said everything's consistent with one. This is a couple of sigma high. Maybe there's something weird going on there. Uh, but generally, these things look as though they're well described by the standard model Higgs. And uh, this tells us a lot about the, the, the structure of the couplings. 
Uh, these are not yet precision measurements. If you look at the errors here, this is, these are errors which uh, are typically they might have 30% errors or something like that. We need to do much, much better than that to, to uh, really to make sure that we understand the Higgs properly. We believe with the full LHC data samples, we can get these down to a few percent. Okay, in addition to the production, there's also the decay. And so this, this pie chart that's shown here is the branching ratios. It's the fraction of times a Higgs produced decays into different final states. So the BB bar is about 50%. It's a bit more than half. The dominant decay of the Higgs is to, to a pair of B quarks. Uh, very rare processes that decay to the two Zs or decay to uh, two photons. But these guys are the ones we discovered it from because we can reconstruct these very cleanly, uh, even though the rate for these is very low. But you get an inkling here. You also realize if we've only seen a tiny fraction of the Higgses, there are a lot more Higgses in the data to be teased out if we can get that. Uh, so uh, we've, we've been looking for the other decay modes, and the WW tau tau uh, by now we've seen. And so this is illustrated. This is a similar type of plot to the previous one, but basically we've observed with more than five sigma significance now, Higgs to gamma gamma, Higgs to four lepton, Higgs to WW, and Higgs to tau tau. Now, Higgs to tau tau is important because this is a, these guys are all, uh, are all bosons, but this guy is fermions. So this starts to tell us that the Higgs is coupling to the fermions as well as the, as the bosons. It's, it, from this, we see rather directly that Higgs is, is coupling to fermions. OK, we can recast that in terms of looking at the strength of the interaction of the Higgs with different uh, with different particles um, as a function of the particle mass. Now, be careful with this plot. It's a very misleading plot because it's a log-log plot, and they're always designed to hide things rather than show things. But um, this is a log-log plot, and you see that basically the different couplings do lie on the straight line. So the proportionality of the coupling of the particle to the mass of the particle is observed, but only so far with a few channels, the top, the W, the Z, and the TT bar. And in fact, the top has not been seen directly, and the B has not been seen very convincingly yet either. So anyway, this, this does look like a Higgs boson. It couples to particles proportional to their mass. It looks as though it's the particle that, that gives us the Higgs mechanism. Another key thing about the Higgs particle is that it should be a scalar. It should have no spin, because there is a vacuum expectation value in the whole of the vacuum of this, of this Higgs field. And the vacuum is space symmetric. So that tells us that there's no preferred directions. It tells us that the spin should, the, the Higgs, if it's really the Higgs, should be a spin zero object. It should have no intrinsic angular momentum. So we can analyze that by looking at the decay products of the Higgs. And the results are shown here. This is, this is a, a variable which is uh, uh, designed to distinguish looking at the different production and decay angles. So here, if I've produced a Higgs here, it, it decays to two Zs, which fly off back to back. And then they each decay in their rest frames to two muons or two electrons back to back. And by looking at the different decay angles, we can, we can uh, analyze, we can do a spin analysis to see if this guy looks like zero plus or some other spin object. And what this plot is showing you is that in each, for each of these hypotheses, there's pairs. This is a hard plot to see when you can't see the vertical lines. But there are pairs here of uh, predictions for the blue for the standard model uh, prediction and the red for an alternative hypothesis. And in each case, the data look like the standard model prediction. So the data look like zero plus, and they don't look like anything else. We, ca we can't say it's not a spin 20 object of some bizarre type, but uh, this is where Occam comes in. Occam would tell us that the simplest hypothesis is probably the right one. So it probably is zero plus, and it's not none of the other nearby solutions, nearby possibilities. So it seems to be a scalar object. It seems to couple to mass as it should do. So what else can we measure about it? Well, we can measure its mass. Uh, remember, in the, in the standard model, the mass of the Higgs is a free parameter. It's the one thing we didn't know about the Higgs when we started looking was what its mass was. So it's one of the most interesting things to measure. To do that, we have to understand the, the performance, the resolution of the detector very precisely. And that's illustrated here. So here I, sh I show the, the difference the ratio of the reconstructed mass of a particle versus its uh, expectation as a function of the momentum of the particles it decays to. So think of a Z. A Z decays to two muons. I look to see how, as a function of the momentum of a muon, how well I can reproduce in the simulation, the, the, how well I understand the momentum of that muon. And the answer is to better than one part in 10 to the 3, so better than, better than one per mil. And so that gives us a very precise calibration of the detector. We do the same for the electrons. I won't go into that. But it gives us a very precise calibration of the detector that allows us to measure the mass of the particle. And so this is the, the, the measurement of the Higgs mass obtained from RUM1. And the, the final result is shown here, 125.09 plus or minus 0.24 GeV. 
that doesn't perhaps mean too much, but this is a two per mil relative error. So already, uh, within a couple of years of discovering this particle, we were able to measure its mass with a two per mil relative error. Okay, we now move on to the 13 TV data, and we are seeing again uh, the Higgs signals in the same place. Now, this may sound trivial, and of course, we all knew we would see the Higgs in the same place, but there were one or two, when you have a collaboration of 3,000 people, there's somebody who says, ah, oh, but it's not real, it's going, to appear, it's not going to be there in the 13 TV data. So we all had slightly bated breath while we were doing this analysis, but it's there in, in the same way in the, in the 13 TV data, at the same mass. And we've also now measured the cross-section, the rate of production of these guys at 13 TV. And it's consistent with the growth expected in the standard model, although the errors are big. And then I, I flash this one because this is a plot which only became public this morning. Uh, and this is the full statistics. This is the four lepton mass distribution. So compare this with the one I showed you at the time of the discovery. This is the background uh, shape for the four lepton case. And this is the, the Higgs signal. And you can see now there's absolutely no doubt. There's not, this is not a statistical fluctuation. It's very clear to the naked eye that this is uh, a new particle being produced. So we've, we've started to make measurements at 13 TV. This is what that says. This, this event I, I like to show, this is a, a candidate Higgs to ZZ event where one decays to electrons, which are the two green, picked out here in green, the two electrons with the track that's associated to them, the charged particle, the electron. And then the two muons are shown in red. Now, if you zoom in and look very close to the interaction point and you look along the beam direction, you can actually see in this lower plot, this is a few centimeters here. But what you can see is these red tracks and the green tracks, when you extrapolate them back, they all come from a single interaction point, as they should, because it's a single particle that's been produced. But you also see there are many other interactions that have happened. And these are ones that have happened in the same beam crossings. So when the beams collide, the, the width of the beams is about 10 microns. So you don't see a transverse spread here. But you, the longitudinal spread is a few centimeters. And so we can separate out the different proton-proton interactions that happened uh, during this single beam crossing. And there's about 25, 30 in this case, which is typical for the run two data. And this is a big experimental challenge, which I don't have time to talk about in more detail. So other channels we're looking for in the run two data, this I can go fast on, we're looking for this TTH production. So this, uh, this diagram that's here, you don't see the pointer very well, but production of top quark pairs together with a Higgs. This is a process we haven't seen and we want to see because it will allow us to probe this vertex very precisely, or, or directly, I should say, rather than precisely. It'll be a while before it's very precise. And then we're also looking for this dominant Higgs to BB R decay because we haven't seen that yet, despite the fact that half of, more than half of the Higgs bosons should be decaying to BB bar. We've not seen it because it's very difficult to tease out of all of the, the large backgrounds. So these are analyses which are ongoing. These are mu plots, and this is uh, from 2015 plus 2016 data. And just to cut it short, you see we don't actually yet have convincing signals for these two, although TTH is getting there. Uh, we see something which is uh, not very consistent with zero at this point. It's about three sigma above zero. So observing these two channels really remains a key goal for run two. This is part of what we're really focusing on now in the Higgs sector for, for, at the LHC. We're also looking then at the second generation of fermions. I meant to put a standard model diagram back on here. But one of the interests is that the fermions we've seen, we've seen decays of Higgs to tau and to B quarks but we'd like to see second generation fermion decays, but they're relatively rare because of the low mass. So we're looking for that. Uh, we place constraints at the moment. It's not exceptionally large. If, it was, if, the, if the Higgs to mu mu decay were as, were as fast as the Higgs to tau tau decay, we would see it here very clearly, but we don't see it. Therefore, it's very suppressed and we will continue looking for it. It requires a lot more data. Okay, so that's a sort of lightning tour of what we're doing in the Higgs sector. It's clear that there are a, a, a vast number of measurements, in fact, many more than the ones that I can show you here, but we're really starting to understand in more detail the properties of this particle. Okay, so what about beyond the Higgs? Well, I'm just going to flash briefly two different areas of what's going on. One is precision measurements, and one is uh, direct searches. So precision measurements, this is another uh, way of probing uh, what is... Uh, uh, the properties of WZ particles, also probing, we test QCD predictions, event generator models, and there's big advances being made in those in recent years. But we can also probe for new physics in loops. So I mentioned the loops previously with, uh, with uh, corrections to the Higgs mass, but there's many other ways that we're sensitive to new physics in loops and uh, existing physics, standard model physics in loops. And then uh, we also are looking for direct searches. And I won't say much about those, but there's a, a huge amount going on. 
So here I show, uh, going back, this is really going back to the 1980s when I started my career in particle physics. At that time, we just discovered the W and Z particles. Now, the W and Z particles are very much our calibration channels. They really help us to understand the detector. But we can also do physics with them. And so here I just show some typical, this is actually from a relatively small 2011 data sample. I just show the distributions of, in this case, the invariant mass of the two muons around the Z. You see a beautiful Z signal. This is a, really a standard candle for us now. Um, for the W, we have a similar type of distribution. We can't, because of the neutrino in a W to electron neutrino decay, we can't fully reconstruct the W, but nonetheless we can reconstruct what we can, and we get, again, a very beautiful, clean W signal with very little background. So we can study the properties of these uh, particles uh, at great, in great depth with very high statistics because we have millions of them from this sample. And so just to, to flash the type of measurements that we're making, here you see this is a, a distribution of, uh, it's actually an angular distribution just of the lepton in the detector, so just of the electron or muon and the angle it makes to the beam direction in the detector transformed into this eta variable. And the data on here are actually shown, they're not shown by all of these things that look like data points. The data is shown by the black and the green. And the, data, the things that look like data points on here are actually the theoretical predictions using different models, particularly of part-on density functions. And they're all over the place compared to the beautiful precision of the data. So this illustrates the, uh, the distinguishing power we have between these uh, different, uh, particularly different part-on density functions with these fantastically accurate data, or, uh, these millions of events we have in this case in the W decay channel. Uh, we can look at the cross-section for producing Ws and Zs uh, just more inclusively than this, and compare that with the predictions of different models as well. And on this point, this curve again, the data point is the black dot that's shown here. The bigger error bars are all the theoretical predictions. Now, as an experimentalist, it's always wonderful to see a plot with uh, experimental data points with errors, ellipses, which are much smaller than the theoretical predictions, because we've learned a lot. And so from this, we're able to derive, in fact, new, part on, new strongly improved parton density functions, and that's work which is going on. So these, these, these are very important, are very useful for that. Another measurement which came out just at the end of last year, which is again on this 7 TV data, so again data collected in 2011, so this is five years from the point we collected the data for the analysis results coming out. This is the mass of the W. So the W boson, of course, was observed back in early 82. We measured its mass with a, a, a decent precision at LEP. They also measured it at the Tevatron. But now at the LHC, with the very high statistics, we can try to measure it much more precisely. So here, this is a, a W event, uh, a W to E nu candidate event. And you see the electron in, in the tracking detectors and the calorimeters. You see you can reconstruct the missing transverse momentum, the missing transverse energy in this event, by looking at the flow of energy in all of the detectors and then saying what recoils against that flow. And that's the PT miss uh, that's shown on here. And from that, we can reconstruct uh, various variables which are sensitive to the mass of the, of, the, of the W boson. OK, so here are two of these variables. This is the, and for the case of W to muon decays, this is the transverse mass that I showed you a distribution of before that's constructed like this. This guy, because of the way it's constructed, this should have an edge uh, or almost the peak, but a little bit the edge at about 80 GV, which is the mass of the W. This guy is the lepton transverse momentum, and this should have a Jacobian edge that's at about 40 GV, about half the mass of the W. So it should, there should be a distribution that goes up, and then it should come down. Ideally, it would come down sharply at 40 GV, and that would give us a very precise measurement of the W. Because the W is produced with some transverse momentum itself, it's moving in the, in the experiment, then this thing is smeared out. But nonetheless, the shape of this gives us information about the W mass. And so uh, we're able to use the shapes of these distributions and fit to measure the W mass. And the, there's, I say it very quickly, but there's a huge amount of study, detailed study, to understand the detector and also the modeling uncertainties to be able to make a measurement like this. This is why it takes uh, five years. It's not because nobody was working on it. It's a team of about 10 people typically working on this analysis for five years in order to be able to get this through. And then here is the results. This is the W mass that we've measured. It's 80.37 GeV uh, with an error of 19 MeV, uh, which is a uh, uh, quarter of a mil, uh, 0.24 per mil. Uh, the, this measurement precision of 19 MeV equals the best ever previous measurement, which came from the Tevatron, which is the CDF measurement that's shown here. 
Uh, and here uh, you see the, the atlas measurement. Compared to at LEP, we ran LEP for about five years producing W pairs in order to make lots of measurements of the Ws, but one of the key ones was the W mass. I, I worked on one of these LEP experiments, and I have to say, it, it's nice to see how much better we do now, but on the other hand, uh, it's a bit of a shame that LEP wasn't able to do better because of lack of statistics. OK, so you see the, the comparison with the previous measurements there. Now, why, why is the W mass interesting? Why do we care so much about a very precise measurement of the W mass? Well, because in the standard model framework, again, there are loop diagrams here, which mean that the W mass gets corrections due to the Higgs and due to the top. And at tree level, electroweak unification would tell you that the W mass and the Z mass are related together in terms of alpha and G mu. This is alpha electromagnetic and G mu, the, the Fermi constant, times this formula without the 1 plus delta R. So the 1 plus delta R comes in here because of these radiative effects. And those radiative effects introduce a dependence. Instead of this very simple relation between w, the W and Z masses that comes from uh, electric unification, uh, one has to uh, include the, the effects of these loops. But these loops are then sensitive to things like the Higgs mass and the top mass. So one can actually use this formula without using information about the W mass to predict the W mass in the standard model um, using the known Higgs mass and top masses. And that's illustrated here. So this, this has actually lost the error bars off the screen, which is uh, a bit annoying. So there are, there, there's a band up here, which is basically just to tell you. This is the electroweak fit measurement, 80.356. And it has a, an error of 8 MeV. And that is a prediction. That is a standard model prediction. This is not a measurement. And then here you see the different measurements, okay? And you can see that the different, uh, that there were, particularly the Tevatron averages were a bit high compared to the prediction. Now the Atlas number, the central value is a bit lower, but of course uh, uh, more uh, will be done. So this can be interpreted then recast in another way of instead of uh, predicting just the W mass, we can predict the W mass and the top mass from all of the other measurements. And that's shown by this gray ellipse on here. Okay, this ellipse looks different. If you saw this in the days of LEP, this ellipse looked different. It's now much narrower, which is because we've measured the Higgs mass. So this also depends on the Higgs mass. But this is the prediction from all of the lower energy, the Higgs mass the, uh, the, and the Higgs mass uh, prediction. And these are the measured value of the top mass and the W mass. Okay, actually from Atlas, both from Atlas in this case. And you see that there is a, a really astonishingly good agreement. And that comes about uh, apparently because the standard model uh, description of the electric loop corrections is correct. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, uh, space here for new physics, but the, the, the quality, the precision of this test can be used to place uh, or to, to make constraints to put it into fits for possible new physics beyond the standard model. But there's no evidence here for new physics beyond the standard model. It looks beautifully well described. OK, there's a lot of scope in future both to reduce the uncertainties on the top mass. Currently, that's 0.7 GeV. We should be able to get down to at least about 0.5 relatively quickly. Uh, the W mass with more work, we can probably get this down uh, much smaller, although how much smaller remains to be seen. The statistical errors are very small on that. OK, another one just to flash. How am I doing for time? Do I have time for massive dibosons? I do. Just. Ten minutes. OK, so massive dibosons. This is a process uh, where there was a puzzle at RUM1, because you have to imagine this plot without the purple curve. And at RUM1, the prediction for the, the cross-section for producing Ws and Zs was shown by this red curve. And uh, the measurements were the blue points from 7 and 8 TV. And there was a problem, because these things were not at all well described. And we spent a lot of time trying to find experimental problems here. But then it turns out that the calculation that was done at that time was a next leading order calculation, which means it includes a set of diagrams, which includes the, the lowest order diagrams, which are the ones shown here, or these are examples. And then it, it included the next leading order diagrams, so ones with another uh, vertex, another gluon vertex, another uh, alpha s in them. But at th that time, the next to next to leading order calculations were not done. Now, in the meantime, after the RUN1 results were out, but before the RUN2 data was collected, that calculation, these next to next to leading order calculations were done. These are immensely complicated calculations, which have to be done by computers. Uh, they can't be done by people, because there are so many diagrams in there. They, I mean, people guide the computer uh, calculations. And that uh, predicted the rise to the, to the value, which is shown in purple here. So this was actually a prediction by the time we measured the, the 13 TV cross-section. And so uh, we seem to have solved this puzzle as to why the diboson cross-sections are not well described by NLO. It seems to be that the NNLO effects are actually quite large. OK, this is important also because although WZ isn't a background to Higgs, WW and ZZ production are backgrounds to Higgs productions. 
Okay, at top production, we've also measured this guy at the new center of mass energy. Just to put the scale, we now have about 30 million TT bar events here. Now, back in when the top was discovered in, in the mid-90s, the late 90s, there, there were a handful of top events. In total, at the Tevatron, they produced a few thousand top events. So again, we've, we have huge step up in statistics. We can study this in much, much more detail. Okay, so here's the whole bunch of cross uh, standard model cross-sections of different processes measured at different centers of mass energies. There's really a huge plethora of uh, uh, industry of, of making these measurements, but I, I don't have time to talk about them. So let me move instead to searches. And I will disappoint Alan because I, I won't spend long on searches because I'm afraid with the data that we've analyzed so far, the answer to the question you have with searches is no. Um, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, however, we are still analyzing. And, I mean, the analysis of the 2015 plus 2016 data is in full flow. And so perhaps there are things that will show up there. And it also has to be said, although we've looked at many, many different channels for different searches, these are relatively low-hanging fruit. These are the easy things to spot. And so here, what, what this plot is showing you is it's showing the limit, the excluded region, uh, as a function of the mass of a, the scale or the, the mass of a new particle or the mass of a new uh, interaction. And this is a TEV. So basically, for many, many different types of models, the production of new particles below about a TEV has now been excluded by the LHC. You can still find uh, little spaces where things could uh, come in. You can devise much more complex models than these, but at least at the first looks, we, we have not seen anything. And the, the excesses that we did start to see in run one, we were getting excited about, they've all gone away in run two without fail. So at the moment, the uh, searches in the different uh, channels are, are uh, drawing a blank, let's say. But you see there are a whole, whole bunch of different types of models. If you stare at this for a while, if you can read it, there's things like extra dimensions here, dark matter searches, contact interactions, leptoquarks, which would be uh, uh, carry both lepton and quark quantum numbers, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, we're not seeing any evidence for any of these at the moment, up to about the TEV scale. OK, I think I'll skip over that. The, this is just uh, one example of the search, a very simple topology, where we're just looking for two jets in the final state. And so we look at the direct invariant mass spectrum. And so this is, this is a rather beautiful event. This is the highest mass dijet event we had. So here you see the interaction point and the jets of particles uh, going out back to back. The invariant mass of this jet is 8 TeV. It's 8.2 TeV. So it's higher than anything we could have produced in run one. So this is a one slide example of, of course, why we wanted to go to 13 TeV. We have sensitivity. We can produce events with much higher energies. This guy, by the way, is this one right on the end of this plot here. So. Unfortunately, it looks like the tail of a distribution, not uh, anything particularly new. So just one thing I did want to point out in particular is the dark matter uh, case. So we're looking for dark matter particles. There's a whole slew of searches going on for dark matter particles, both very generically looking for dark matter produced with other objects, like perhaps a jet uh, that might come from uh, initial state radiation that might be radiated off the colliding uh, quarks. Uh, the dark matter we wouldn't see in the detector. So we're looking for missing ET signatures. We're looking for missing transverse momentum plus something like an energetic jet in the detector. Uh, the, results of the, or the results that we've shown for those are also uh, pushing the limits rather than giving us signals. Um, we also have many searches going on in supersymmetric models. And I did, took a deliberate decision not to talk about SUSY in this talk because you have one of the world experts on SUSY, particularly experimental searches on SUSY, in the room here. So he can uh, tell you about that offline. But uh, in SUSY models as well, this is a similar type of plot of the different SUSY searches. And again, I'm afraid we're, at the moment we're just pushing limits. But there's a lot of sophisticated analysis going on. And there's a lot of sensitivity still in the 2016 data. And so things could still be showing up in, the, in SUSY, either in the 2016 data or in future. But it's, gonna, it's a long haul for searches at this point, uh, or at least after the summer, it'll be a long haul. So let me take a, then move to a look to the future. OK, so run two of the LHC at 13 TeV is running, and we'll run until the end of 2018. Then we'll have another two-year stop. And then we'll have run three, which where we'll push the energy up a little bit to 14 TeV, uh, training the magnets up to 14 TeV. But we'll run for three years, get a similar data sample to, to run two at the higher energy, so uh, doubling. Uh, in this uh, uh, LS2 stop, however, we are making further improvements to the, uh, both to the LHC, particularly to the LHC injectors, and also uh, uh, the training of the magnets, and also uh, significant upgrades to the experiments. So just one slide on the experiment upgrade. So, 
This, uh, in Atlas jargon, this is a very small upgrade, the upgrade that we're doing in LS2. Uh, uh, so the idea is that because the luminosity continues to go up, we need to improve the triggering of Atlas, the selectivity of events that we do online. Um, and so as part of that, one of the things we're doing is installing some new NCAP muon detectors. Now, it's a bit of a long story as to why our NCAP muon triggering isn't as good as it should be, but we can improve it by installing these new, uh, new small wheel detectors. Now, if, you, if you're not used to our jargon, it's, new, it's a small wheel, this thing, because we have big wheels, but this is nine meters in diameter, so it's not that small. Okay. So uh, then thereafter, however, we then go to the next phase of the project, which I haven't really talked about so far, which is the so-called Hilumi LHC. And the goal here is to accumulate 10 times more data than in the previous data sample combined. And that is done by a big upgrade to the accelerator and also big upgrades to the detectors. And this, will, the, the, this has actually now been approved. It was approved by CERN Council in June 2016. And the cost of this was, is about 930 million Swiss francs. But the cost of the accelerator upgrade will be taken from the CERN budget. Uh, it can be done from the CERN operating budget. But it will run, mean that the LHC really runs through until uh, about 2037. Okay, briefly on the physics program, there's uh, the, the further precision measurement, much more precise measurement of the Higgs boson's uh, properties, its production, decay, couplings, and so on. But also a new channel will start to open up with the very high luminosities, which is to produce pairs of Higgs bosons, which is particularly interesting because they tell us about the triple Higgs coupling, which is a coupling which otherwise we won't be able to probe. This is particularly sensitive to the shape of the Higgs potential, and so it's a particularly uh, interesting thing to, to be looking for. We also, of course, by the time we get there, we may have discovered other new particles. I, I didn't give you too much hope on that, but with that we, we may well. There is still a lot of space to potentially discover new particles. And of course, uh, if we do, there will be a bonanza to study those particles. Uh, we can also continue the search program and get about another 30% increase in mass reach from the extra luminosity. So to do that, th this is the current Atlas detector. We will replace, in fact, a lot of uh, Atlas. We have to replace the central tracking detector. The calorimeters, the muon system, will be basically unchanged. Uh, we'll add some new muon chambers on the inner layer of this detector. Uh, but we do have to replace essentially all of the electronics to cope with much higher data rates that, that will come. The total capital cost of this is about 250 million uh, Swiss francs. The phase two tracking detector that will be there in the center of the detector, that's this red blob that I've shown you here, uh, my not very good artistic skills. But this is what the uh, phase two tracking detector looks like. It's an all silicon sensor uh, tracker uh, that will be very radiation hard and very high uh, bandwidth capabilities. And the design for this is actually last week was uh, uh, the, uh, the case for this was approved uh, to proceed towards construction. And then looking at the even longer term, and so this is really for the young people in the room rather than people like me, but looking beyond the LHC, we're now looking really, or CERN is thinking hard about the next project beyond HLLHC. So the, the concept exists, or is, is being discussed now for a much larger collider. This is the so-called FCC, Future Circular Collider. And on the picture of CERN, the LHC, which you're used to seeing this huge great ring, this is the LHC and this is the FCC. So it's about a, it would be about a 100 kilometer tunnel it actually would go underneath the lake uh, near to Geneva and go around the back of the Salev Mountains. It uh, would have a luminosity which is uh, 30 times higher than the LHC design luminosity. Um, and it would have direct sensitivity to new physics to producing new particles up to about the 10 TeV scale rather than the 1 TeV scale that we have at the LHC. So it pushes way beyond LHC. And so if these fine-tuning and hierarchy ar arguments uh, are correct, then we should be expecting new physics to show up in the few TV scale. There, I, I can find you theorists. Uh, uh, Nima Arkani Hammond, for example, will swear to you that new physics will show up by 10 TV. I, I'm not quite as confident as that, but it's, it's certainly a hugely uh, extended reach. In addition, one could put electrons in this machine and have electron positron collider or uh, electron proton options. Now, uh, this could start operation around 2040 if the go ahead were given. And this is a discussion that will be take place in the coming years as to whether uh, we should go ahead with this. It, it will take at least 20 years to construct, which is why uh, we need to start making the decision rather soon, just as the LHC took a long time to construct. But there's really a lot of uh, thinking going on now. This, by the way, if you don't know the Geneva area, this is the Jura Mountains. Uh, you can, on a day when there's actually got snow on them, which are fairly rare these days. 
And so the, the concept of a detector for FCC, this actually doesn't look very different to Atlas when you, start, when you look at it quickly. It's actually also a very similar size. The detector concept that would be needed for FCC, the size is about the same. It's about 45, 50 metres long and about 25 metres across. So a similar size to Atlas. But of course, this is a, a quite different technologies that would be needed at this, uh, this machine. So this is something which is being talked about right now. So let me come to my closing words, uh, which are that Atlas and CMS's collaborations are now 25 uh, as of this year. And we had a long gestation because, of course, we only re they only really gave birth to these uh, detectors in about 2007, 2008. Um, but we have now eight years since the first collisions. Uh, the LHC is really now in a, what I hope you've seen as a really mature production phase, really churning out uh, collisions at the design energy. Uh, the, sorry, the design luminosity and close to the design energy, although we still have that extra 1 TV step to 14 TV. And with the large run two samples being collected now, the physics program is also changing to a more mature phase. Uh, the luminosity doubling time, the amount, in which we double, amount of time in which we do double the data sample is becoming longer. It's one to two years now. Um, and that means that the search topologies, we are looking very deeply into the data, but the simpler search topologies are, are to some extent explored uh, and results are coming out. But we will be looking at increasingly complex searches. And also, uh, particularly important, the, the precision measurements will also have increasing importance as we go forwards. But despite that, remember, we only have about 2% of the final statistics from the LHC at this point. And so the LHC will remain the world's discovery and precision particle collider for the next two decades. <laughs> So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that was a fascinating overview. The, the floor is now over to, to you. Can and put the lights up? Yeah, we can do that. And we can see you. It's, it is somewhat distracting. I can't see you. Can't ah, there we are. Well, they're working on now. So, so uh, what, what would you like to ask? Would you like to ask? Yes. I had a question about the detectors. You, you mentioned that you're going to upgrade the detectors in the coming years, and that was very interesting. But can I pose the question in a slightly different way? You said that the detectors were built 20 years ago, or at least designed, designed, yes. designed 20 years ago. So suppose you had today's technology, 20. What would what would have happened? Would you have got better statistics, or would you have got um, something else ever done? Yeah, we'd, we'd be able to run with much more open triggers. If we had now, I mean, the same. The question is almost the same as saying, what if we had the upgrades now? Yeah, right. And what would happen is we would have a much higher bandwidth, so we'd be able to uh, we'd be able to read out many more events off the detector, and we'd be able to do a lot more physics. In terms of things like WZs, top quarks, Higgses, it probably wouldn't make that much difference. But in terms of the much wider physics program of jets, jet physics, uh, V physics, all of this stuff, which we've had to throttle back, we would be able to do far more of that. So there would be an even wider physics program than we have at the moment. I should say, you, 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 because in any talk about the LHC you only talk about a handful of analyses. There, there's, there's hundreds of analyses going on at a time. This is why we, can, why we have a 1,000 PhD students. It's because each of those PhD students, there's typically only two or three PhD students working on a particular analysis. Sorry, that wasn't the question. That was a very interesting thing, since we have some students. Yeah. Uh, ben, what is the current state of the LHC? Is it still working? Yeah, thanks. I, I, one of the things that fell out of the talk was the whole computing system. So uh, um, the, the, there's different challenges. So there's the, the challenge of how the, you, you sift the billion interactions per section, se the, the seconds that come off the detector and keep at the moment about a thousand events per second, about a thousand bunch crossings per second, I should say, which you yeah. That you have to do very fast. The first level you have to do in, in electronics, it's done with FPGAs and fast electronics. That gives you something like a factor of 1,000 reduction. And then the rest of the reduction you get from software, which is running on, on PC farm. Right? We have a PC farm, which is, I forget the number of CPUs, maybe about 20,000 uh, core CPUs, which is sitting just above the experiment. But then around the world, we rely on the worldwide LHC computing wheels. So that, that's basically 200 sites, including one here in Oxford, I'm sure. Um, and uh, we can typically run about a quarter of a million jobs at a time. We're using about a quarter of a million CPU cores on the, on the worldwide LHC computing grid at a time. And that allows us to reconstruct the data. But then what most of the time actually goes in is to simulate what would happen in, in, in typical interactions. And so really a huge amount of the, 
uh, development in this generation of experiments relative to previous generations has been that those simulations are much more accurate, much more representative of what happens in the detector than they used to be. And that is one of the reasons why we can do so much of this, this physics so, uh, so well, is because of these high quality simulations. So yeah, we have about uh, 250,000 uh, CPU cores around the world. In terms of something like an HPC resource, that's not that much. There are HPCs with a quarter of a million cores in them. And in fact, we got one of them recently. We got one for two weeks, and it was wonderful. You saw the number of jobs, and suddenly for two weeks, we had half a million jobs running. But not everything we run will run on HPC uh, resources. And of course, HPC is used for other things like weather forecasting and so on. So we don't, we don't get access to it very often. But we really are able to run on any computing resource which is available. We also run on BOINC, which is this uh, uh, LHC at home type thing. You can actually run it as a screensaver on your PC, and you can use the spare cycles, and actually burn more of your electricity these days. But nonetheless, <laughs> if you want to run uh, Atlas at home, we would be very happy, because we get more Monte Carlo statistics if you run it. Yes. Uh, I was wondering which particles are you expecting to find, because Strong interaction energies are very high. Weak uh, interaction energies, W, Z, and Higgs, etc., you have found. So, what thresholds are you crossing with your 13, 14 TV? Well, the, 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 the simple answer to your question is we don't know. I mean, the, the, we're, we're in an interesting point at this stage in the LHC that we are entering uncharted territory. We have good theoretical arguments to think that there should be new physics coming at the TEV or 10 TEV scale. But whether it's the TEV scale or 10 TEV scale, we don't know. And we don't know precisely what the nature of that new physics is. There are hundreds of different theories. The different searches I've shown were basically different ideas as to what that new physics could be. As an experimentalist, I'm not going to say I like one and not the other, because we have to look for everything. We have to search with open minds. So we, don't, we just don't know what's coming. It could be new, heavier versions of the existing particles. Um, maybe there are heavier Higgs bosons. I didn't have time to talk about that, but we're searching for heavier Higgs bosons. There could be, I mean, every other particle in the standard model, there's more than one of them. But for the Higgs, there just seems to be one. Is this, is this right? We don't know. I mean, there, there, there's so many, as I say, there are almost questions we've forgotten to ask because we know the standard model works. But there's, what else is that? Our, our theoretical colleagues in the past have been remarkably bad at telling us what it is that we should be looking for, with a couple of exceptions. Yeah, Peter Higgs, <laughs> Francois Engler and uh, Robert Brandt. <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious that I'm sort of continuing the trend of older people asking question, questions and younger people waiting for the dinner. So while I'm asking the question, I suggest the younger people think of a, a question to ask. But I, but I want to ask a sort of a slightly provocative question. Right? So, so uh, our civilization's selling point, I think, is that, is that we sort of understand, we've understood the grand design of the world. Right? I mean, you know, the sort of the building blocks, the principles, and so on. So if barbarian hordes sack Geneva tomorrow and shut down CERN, or equivalently well-meaning politicians stop your funding, uh, um, and, this is all, and this all ends now, right? What will the future historians say? They, 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 what, what will they say? They have failed to understand what? Well, we get in these grand terms. I mean, what, what, what are we going to lose when, when, when this all ends? Let me, all let, ends me, let, me ask, ask let me ask you a question. Let me try and answer your question with a question. What would have happened if we stopped in physics uh, in 1900? Oh, you, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's how I answer the politicians, of course, because that argument works with the politicians. Yeah. But, uh, well, so what uh, do you think? We, well, we I think we don't know. We don't, I mean, we, really, we, we don't know. I mean, the, the, there's so many weird questions. I mean, the whole dark matter, dark energy issue. I mean, what is going on there? Is there I mean, maybe dark matter is, is WIMPs. Maybe it's electro-weekino type uh, objects. Maybe it's something utterly and completely different. Maybe it's axions or something like this. Maybe it's a whole mix of the. Of the different. Maybe there's a whole set, I mean, there's a dark universe rather than just some dark matter particles. We don't know. And the, the, so there are questions like that which are part of the scenery, but I don't want to propose that, you know, that people try to say, oh, is the, you know, is, is the goal to solve dark matter in the future running of the LHC? And that is a goal. It is not the only goal. The other, we want to see what's there. We're trying to be as open-minded as possible. But I don't know. The answer to your question is, I know we will know almost nothing about the Higgs boson if we stop running the LHC tomorrow. Um, and we can know a heck of a lot more about it if we continue to run it. But I don't, 
I, I don't know what, where, where the next, where the next uh, new particles, where the next physics is coming. What so happens, yeah. would it be correct to interpret your 1900 analogy by saying, in some sense, we've run out of questions and the challenge is to go in search of new questions rather than answer the existing ones? Well, I think we have the questions, but we don't have any insight as to, or we, we, we don't know where the answers to those questions are going to be. I, I don't want to say we don't have any insight as to how to, because we know how to try and find solutions to those questions and how to, where, you know, where we can look for things. But we don't know where the answers are going to be. So I don't, I'm not sure it's quite as simple I, as I will, but this, we need no, new then questions. Then it's not 1900, because 1900 we would have died happy. Uh, I think this study is, is taking I think up I too. I'm giving the students time to come up with something. I, I know, I, I'm, and we thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, All right, people get, well, would, would any of the other students like to close like There's no the problem with robotics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got one. Come on. So the LHC is a you know, shining example of international scientific collaboration success. Um, why, on the other hand, ETA is still holding the ground? So, uh, I think ETA has a very nice concrete platform, actually, these days. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think, I mean, ETA will get, I mean, ETA is an incredibly ambitious project. I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, there, there is, I mean, ETA is, is completely and utterly separate from CERN, of course, different countries, etc. But, and, and it has different problems in terms of its organization that CERN doesn't have, because CERN, it tries to get things done in the member states according to the amount of money that member states pay, but CERN figures out how to spend its money. And I think with ITER, this is not quite so simple. I'm not an expert on it, you should ask an expert on ITER, but I think that it's not set up in quite the same way. There's a bit more uh, requirement of having to bring together things, the, the things that the individual nations want to contribute. But ITER is a very, very challenging project. I mean, the, the magnet system we have in Atlas is the largest superconducting magnet system in the world. It won't be when ITER comes on stream. I mean, so our magnet experts, for example, are also working together with ITER. And so there's, but the technology of what they're trying to do is tough. But yeah, I mean, LHC, uh, LHC didn't stick to its schedule, let's, let's be clear. The LHC, when people originally had the idea back in the 1980s, they thought we could run the LHC in the mid-90s, which of course we couldn't. When it really got into a serious, properly scheduled construction project, it was going to be ready in 2005. And it wasn't, it was ready in 2008. It was not properly ready in 2008, so it exploded. And so then it came back in 2009. So it's, these things do take longer than you, than you expect. But cost-wise, the LHC came close to its uh, correct cost. The experiments were costed at the total capital cost of 475 million. So strength, they were approved for that. And the eventual final cost was 550. Now, on the scheduling, I can remember during my own PhD thesis, the time until first being at the LHC was an invariant the whole way through my, my PhD. <laughs> it was, was continuing to be five years. But, but soon after, it did. Yeah, yeah. Well. eventually things turned around. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can't solve the problems with it, but I, 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 it's, it's a tough problem. Um, the, the LHC, by virtue of being a hadron collider, is obviously not doing these kind of... Uh, Electron and positron collisions that uh, you think or that, is, that are planned for the FCC. Um, by virtue of these different kind of processes, as opposed to just kind of the energy, obviously these processes can be done at other colliders at less high energy. Yes. Is there anything specific to these kind of new processes that you'll be able to do at those higher energies in the FCC that make that interesting or if you expect to find? Yeah, I think uh, if, if uh, what you're talking about is trying to measure the Higgs more precisely, um, apart from extremely rare things, like perhaps the, the, more, the Higgs pair production that I, I mentioned right at the end, that I think may be easier at the FCC than any of the circular plus and minus colliders. So it's not so clear with a linear plus and minus colliders. There you can maybe get access with enough central mass energy. But for the, the other precision studies of the Higgs, you don't gain so much. I mean, you don't really gain from the highest entry mass energy. You, the real gain of going to the FCC, the reason you would build the FCC is to have a as a discovery machine. It will do precision physics as well. But I think the reason you would build it is because you think you're going to, that there is likely to be something that you can discover in that region, new physics or new uh, science and new phenomena. And we may yet get more hints on that through things like precision measurements. I didn't talk at all about new physics and the whole program of the LHCB uh, experiment, which is trying to measure the B decays very precisely, which through loop corrections, again, is giving uh, 
potentially sensitivity to, to very high mass objects or that might be on the TV, 10 TV range. So there might be some hints from also from those precise measurements, which I didn't have time to talk about. But we'll know more about it in the next few minutes. And obviously we can't keep building bigger and bigger colliders forever, so what do you think would come after? Well, people are thinking, I mean, they're, they're, you can't keep building bigger and bigger colliders with the same technology, but the, the people are thinking about how you can get acceleration much more rapidly, much shorter distance, much higher field acceleration of particles. And, so, and also, there's all sorts of ideas about plasma acceleration and so on, which at the moment is very far from any realization in an accelerator. But you can accelerate all particles very, very high gradients. But of course, you don't need all particles, you need production around it. So you need to be colliding particles all the time. Um, so Professor Hooker needs to step up to the plate on yeah. this. <laughs> There's also ideas of, of muons, of whether we could collide muons rather than protons. This is an idea which has been around for a long time, but uh, 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 muon, the advantage of muons is you can bend them rather fast, but they're elementary particles like electrons. And therefore, you could get part on the equivalent of part of part on central mass energy, so the left on left on central mass energies, which are very high. So, uh, but the, the problem is the muons decay after uh, 10 to the minus 5 seconds in the rest room. So, uh, it's uh, quite a tricky technology, and uh, people have been thinking about it for a long time. But maybe people will get out. But yeah, ultimately, we'll stop. I mean, ultimately, once we've got to. It's a conflict of the earth. I forget what this after to, what the next from a thousand TV is, but you know, once we get there, we may find we have to stop. I don't know, or somebody, or somebody in the room, or your children may have bright ideas. <laughs> My question may be more for Han, actually. Um, uh, well, Some of us really, really, really want to know the answer to the question of supersymmetry, is it? Will the FCC deliver a verdict? Um, uh, it's probably more diplomatic if I give it to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, space, the space for supersymmetry to hide, if it's there, electroweak scale supersymmetry, this, it's shrinking all the time. But there's still a lot of space there. Um, and I, I, I'm only thinking about the LHC. Uh, for FCC, uh, you push the scale a lot higher. Can we see? I, uh, yeah, let me pass it to you. Well, what? But a priori, you don't know the upper bind on the scale, right? So it could be, these particles could be very, very heavy. They could be as heavy as the Planck scale. Uh, they don't solve the fine-tuning problem that David was talking about, but they might still be there. But if you want them to solve the fine-tuning problem, then you want some of them to be not much heavier than a TEV. And the problem is the question of how much not much heavier than a TEV is an aesthetic question. It, it, it's an Occam question. It, it really is how... how how fine-tuned do you want your... your How fine is fine-tuned? Exactly. Are you happy with one part in 100 tuning? That's maybe all right, one part in 10. So, so it's a, it's a very, it's a very uh, subjective question. I think what you can say about the FCC is that if dark matter is made of weakly interacting massive particles, where weakly, by weakly interacting I mean interacts through the weak force, <coughs> then the FCC pretty much finds them or rules that out as being the, the mechanism of which, uh, by which dark matter exists. So in, in that sense, you can make reasonably definitive statements. But I, again, it's like the LHC. There's, no, there's actually no one thing that you can say, this is the absolute selling point of it. Really, there's about half a dozen things, all of which are interesting and which you'd like to explore. And the Higgs self cutting thing, a big part of that. And, you, you, until you actually go there and explore it, you don't know which is going to be the most interesting thing, I think. Yeah, we also don't know what happens elsewhere. I mean, maybe uh, somebody starts to detect uh, dark matter, direct dark matter interactions, which would give us more hints about uh, where to look, what energy is going. So there's, uh, you just, we don't know at this point, I think, is the, we don't really know the details of the case for the FCC at this point. Yeah, maybe last question. Just to quickly follow up on that, what, what do you, how do you see the likelihood of LHC in comparison to tabletop experiments with that man? Because I know there are quite a lot of experiments around. Right? Yeah, but the, 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 they're, different, they're different types of experiments. I, I have one slide on the button, actually, which is in the back, which maybe I can show. But uh, um, the, the, it just, the, the, if this is the diagram, what the, the experiments are looking for dark matter, they're looking for direct detection. They're looking for uh, dark matter which is ambient and scattering off 
uh, off quarks in, uh, in uh, nuclei. Whereas what we're doing is we're trying to produce these guys. So they're, they're orthogonal, I mean really orthogonal in terms of the function diagram. They're orthogonal ways of trying to attack the same problem. And so we, you can, in models, you can try and look at the different sensitivities of different experiments. This one, I've picked one which is very favorable to the LHC compared to the direct dark matter experiments. I'll, I'll be honest here. But basically, for low mass dark matter particles, the sensitivity, this is really gone, but the sensitivity of the LHC to low mass particles is really much, much better than the dark matter experiments so far. But when you go to higher masses, the dark matter experiments win out. And of course, this is all very model specific. So I think there's a huge complementarity in, in these different experiments. And I, I don't know which is more likely to see it first. It will depend on things like whether, first of all, whether it is wind dark matter. If it is wind dark matter, uh, I don't know who will see it first. I mean, it could well be that this new generation of xenon experiments may have a, have a good chance. Good. I think at this point uh, we've probably grilled you for quite long enough and I think you've definitely earned your dinner. Uh, so I think uh, we could give you one more round of applause as thanks. And <laughs>